As evening approaches, a thick London fog moves quietly across the still waters of the Thames River, spreading along the cobblestone streets, covering the familiar landscape of the city. In Baker Street, the lodgings of 221B are empty, for Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have left long ago on another case of murder. Hello, my name is Ben Wright. Welcome to the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The radio play you are about to hear was originally broadcast on the 7th of June, 1945. At that time, the war in Europe was almost over. We were, however, still fighting in the Pacific, and it was essential during the war years that radio do everything in its power to keep up the morale of the people, to make them conscious of the need to give and give freely to the war effort that all men could remain free. It was no different for the Sherlock Holmes radio series. Unlike the Sherlock Holmes movies of the time, the radio series was not set during the war, but retained its original time frame of Victorian England. How then to enlist this popular series to bring across a message in wartime? Although Holmes and Watson had long retired, it was possible to involve them in, if not the Second World War, at least the First World War for they would have been very much alive then. The Victorian era was just about gone when the First Great War broke out. In fact, the war effectively killed it. But thanks to the cleverness of Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson could once again come to the aid of their country. The broadcast of In Flanders Fields was made part of a war bond rally in order to raise money to continue the fight against the enemy in the Pacific. I think it's an interesting note that Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher met at an earlier and similar war bond rally a few years earlier. It was a stroke of luck, for the two became not only good friends, but wrote some of the best of the new Sherlock Holmes adventures. Oh yes, before we get to the show, do take careful note of Nigel Bruce's final statements at the end of the broadcast. Selling war bonds may be an amusing and quaint idea today, But during those rather dark days, it really was an important issue. And now, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in the radio drama In Flanders Fields. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. From the stage of the Paramount Theater in Hollywood, Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petrie family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know something? If right now it were possible for me to ask every one of you what you had for dinner this evening... I'll bet a good many of you would say chicken. Chicken is an all-American favorite. But boy, you just haven't tasted chicken till you've tried it together with a glass of well-chilled Petri California Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a perfect mealtime wine, just made to go with chicken. That Petri Sauterne is a white wine, delicate in color, and mmm, mmm, what a flavor. A flavor that comes right from the heart of luscious, sun-ripened grapes. You can just taste those wonderful grapes. And I'll tell you something... That Petri Sauterne is pretty much on the terrific side when served with fish or any kind of seafood, too, and that's a fact. But say, whenever you serve that Petri Sauterne, remember you can serve it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now for our weekly doctor's appointment. Let's knock on his library door and see if... There's no point in doing that, Mr. Slattery. I'm right behind you. Oh, hello, Dr. Watson. Don't tell me you've been stalking me. <laughs> no, my boy. I was on the patio and I heard your footsteps, so I thought that I'd, I'd come in and fetch you. Let's go back and sit out there, shall we? It's, it's a beautiful evening. That's fine with me, Doctor. Ah, uh, here we are. 
Now, settle yourself down in a chair and, and light a cigarette, if you have one. And I'll get on with my story. Well, last week, you told us it concerned an adventure that you and Sherlock Holmes had in Flanders during the First World War. That's right, Mr. Slattery, you did. I thought that you and the great man had retired at that period. We had, my boy, but it was only natural that as soon as the war broke out, we both offered our services in any capacity that might help our country. Of course, and how did tonight's story begin, Doctor? It was in the winter of that first year. Things weren't going very well for the Allies. The Germans were advancing on Paris, and the picture was looking very black. It was just 24 hours before the famous Battle of the Marne began, the battle that changed the early course of the war, when Holmes told me that we had to go up to the front lines on a secret mission. We'd been in Paris for several weeks, where Holmes had just solved the case of the missing aide de -camp. I was anxious to get back to England and my work in the war hospitals, but of course this new summons was in the nature of a command. And so, late on a rainy September afternoon, Holmes and I, with the boom of gunfire in our ears, found ourselves in the front seat of a staff car, slushing and jolting its way towards the battlefield. Am I driving too fast for you, gentlemen? No, Sergeant, not at all. No, no, you're doing a splendid job. Oh, my man, look out, considering the state of the road. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello. The gunfire's getting nearer, Holmes. Yes, old fellow. I imagine we haven't much further to go, have we, Sergeant? No, sir, we're nearly there. Did you notice the two civilians in the, in the back seat, Holmes? Yes. Handsome woman and a distinguished looking man, several years her senior. I wonder who they are. I'll tell you. He's a Shakespearean actor of some note. Oh. Though he never achieved the fame to which he thinks he's entitled. I shouldn't be at all surprised if he feels that he's been slighted and not receiving a knighthood. But Holmes, that's amazing. How can you possibly deduce all that from just looking at the man as we got into the car? Elementary, my dear fellow, I didn't deduce it. We saw him twice last year in the London theater, if you remember. What? His name is Maitland Morris. As for his biography, he's a friend of my brother, Mycroft's. He told me about him. Well, what do you suppose he's doing up here near the front line? His brother is General Sir Stanley Morris, who's in command of this particular front, and it would seem reasonable to presume that his brother has come up here to give a performance for the front line troops. Ah, I suppose this hut is as far as we can drive, Sergeant. I'm afraid so, sir. We're four miles from the front line now. You'll have to clear your papers here. Uh, see that ruined farmhouse there, sir? Yes, Sergeant. Is that the General's headquarters? Yes, sir. Come on, Watson. Good Lord, it's pelting with rain. Yeah, let's make a dash for it. Oh, who goes there? Friend. Give the password. St. Crispin. Pass friends and show your papers. How did you know the password, Holmes? I was given it before we left Paris, old chap. Oh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, isn't it? Yes, Captain. I'm Captain Maxwell, uh, General Morris's aide-de-camp. He asked me to escort you up to his headquarters. Uh, by the way, weren't Maitland Morris and his wife in the car with you? Yes, they're just behind us. Oh, splendid. I'm afraid I'll have to ask to see your papers. Yes, of course. Here's, uh, here's my permit, Captain mm -hmm. Maxwell. Thank you. I know you both, of course, but we can't afford to take any chances when they're this close to the enemy lines. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yes, that's fine, Doctor. Everything's in order. All right, good. Uh, yours, please, Mr. Holmes. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Oh, who goes there? Friend. There's the rest of your party now. Oh, good. This is quite oh, in order, Mr. Holmes. Oh, oh, there you are, Captain Maxwell. Oh, hello, sir. Hello, Mrs. Murray. How are you, Captain Maxwell? Well, you've both met Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, I suppose? Well, no, we haven't, even though we drove up in the same car. Natural reserve of us Britishers, I suppose. How are you, Mr. Holmes? How do you do, sir? I know your brother Mycroft very well. Uh, how are you, Doctor? I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Morris. I saw you a couple of times in the theatre last year and enjoyed your performances very much. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, then you must know my wife, my leading lady. How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do, Mr. You. Morris? Uh, can I see your papers, Mr. Morris? Uh, just a matter of form. You oh, understand? Yes, 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 of course, of course. Uh, Mrs. Morris, I presume you and your husband are going to give a performance tonight for the men going up the front line. Yes, Doctor. We're very flattered. They've asked us to do some Shakespearean things. Oh, yes. Yeah. Although I should have thought something a little lighter would have been more appropriate. The general, he's Maitland's brother, you know, seemed to think differently. Well, my dear, show Captain Maxwell your papers. Then we can all go along and see my brother Stanley. Very well, Maitland. Mr. Morris, I shall look forward to hearing your reading of Shakespeare's St. Crispin's speech from Henry V tonight. Well, bless my soul, Holmes. 
How did you know I was planning to do it? Well, the setting is so perfect and the time so appropriate, I can't conceive an English actor who could resist the temptation. Oh. I, I noticed that your brother appreciated the fact in naming today's password. Yes, it's amazingly appropriate. You know, it's almost 500 years ago to the day that the Battle of Agincourt took place. Well, let's hope that the results of the forthcoming battle will be equally successful for England. Yes, indeed. Oh, by the way, Holmes, this will probably seem rather silly to you, but I'm an inveterate autograph collector, and I have my book here with me. I, I wonder if you'd mind signing it. I should be very glad to, Mr. Morris. Give me a pen, will you, Watson? Uh, uh, here we are, Holmes. You'll find yourself among quite distinguished company in that <laughs> book, sir. So I see, and Alina Patty, Crown Prince of Norway. Oh, no. Field Marshal von Tauchnitz. Oh, yes. He was one of my admirers when I played in Munich before the war. I suppose now that our countries are fighting, I should tear that page out. You know, I cannot help but feel that art and the appreciation of art are independent of national hatred. Quite so, sir. I myself still have a medal presented to me by the University of Leipzig for some trifling services. There you are, Mr. Morris. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. A notable addition to my collection. Uh, I shall be very glad to sign your book for you, Mr. Morris, if you'd like me to. Uh, that's very kind of you, Doctor. Oh, Captain Maxwell, oh, 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 if our oh, permits are all in order, don't you think we should be moving along? Uh, just what I was going to suggest myself. Uh, I'll take you all straight over to General Morris's headquarters. General Morris, uh, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? How do you do, sir? How are you, General? Uh, how do you do? Uh, know a lot about you. Uh, long way from Baker Street, isn't it? Yes, indeed, sir. Uh, where's that brother of mine? Ah, oh, there you are, Maitland. Uh, Cynthia, uh, how nice to see you both. Oh, it's good to see you again, Stanley. Hello there, Stanley. Mm, the men will be glad you arrived. They're looking forward to your show tonight. <laughs> We're very flattered that they want to hear us do some Shakespeare. Oh, rubbish, old boy. With you and Cynthia up there on the platform, you could read the telephone book and they'd love you. Oh, very kind. Uh, by the way, you will find the stage very primitive, just a few trestles and a large tent and a curtain made of army blankets. And your dressing room will be even worse. Oh, don't worry <laughs> about our comfort, Stanley. As long as we cheer the boys up, that's the important thing. Yes, of course. By the way, what program do you have mapped out for us? Well, I thought we'd have two shows. Uh, the tent's not large enough to hold everybody at once. Anybody, anyway, uh, uh, we have to keep up an alert all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, think you can manage two uh, separate shows? Oh, of course I can, Stanley. I may look old, but I don't feel it. <laughs> you don't even look at your scoundrel. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps we could take a look at the stage and equipment, eh? Oh, certainly. Uh, Captain Maxwell, uh, take them over to the tent and show them what the facilities are, will you? Right, sir. Will you follow me? Oh, yes, of course. See you later, Stanley. Come along, my dear. All right. I'm glad you're here, Holmes. I'm sure I can speak quite freely in front of Dr. Watson. Oh, yes, with perfect freedom, sir. He's my colleague, and he's an old army man himself. Really? What regiment, Doctor? The 5th Northumberland Fusiliers, sir. Later attached to the Berkshires in Afghanistan and, and wounded in, in the Battle of Mainwan. Really? <laughs> then I'm sure I can speak freely in oh, front of you. Was... Um, Holmes, oh. uh... You know why you're up here so near the front line, don't you? I have a very shrewd suspicion, sir. Yeah, I thought you had. That's why I asked for you to be sent here. You asked for me to be sent here, General. Yes, I, I think I understand. Well, I wish I did. Uh, you will, Doctor, in due time. In the meanwhile, gentlemen, I'll have an orderly show you to your quarters. Thank you, sir. And, uh, Holmes, uh, take a look around, will you, and keep your ears open. Uh, where comparatively a little distance from the German front lines, and yet there's a very puzzling silence just now. Yes, I noticed that, sir, and half an hour ago on our way up, there was, there was quite a lot of shilling. Exactly. It's unnatural and rather frightening at a time like this. You see, we're attacking at dawn. The enemy might be trying to infiltrate spies, and the whole success of this battle depends on a surprise attack. I quite understand, sir. Come on, Watson. <laughs> The first performance starts in a few minutes, you know. They're all there waiting. Well, why are we tramping about out here in the mud in the rain? I thought a pipe or two in the open air would clear our brains. Yes, a <clears> pipe <throat> in the open air is one thing, but a pipe in a downpour of rain is another. Was it raining? Oh, didn't even notice it. I was listening to the silence. What do you mean? Thousands upon thousands of Germans. Armed Germans. Full of a blind fanatical hatred and desire to kill. 
are crouched in trenches only a mile or two from here. Surrounding us are an equal number of English boys, also armed. And with the will, if not the desire, to fight. Because they know their cause is the cause of freedom and justice. All these thousands poised, ready to pounce on each other and fight to the death. And yet, beyond that patter of rain, there isn't a, isn't a sound to break the stillness of a September evening. Huh. Strange world we live in, old chap. You're being unusually rhetorical, Holmes. Yes, I am, aren't I? Let's be a little more practical, shall we? I wonder what is wrong with the actors tonight. Act? Oh, why do you ask that? Well, a little while ago, I noticed Mrs. Morris in a great state of excitement going towards the farmhouse where the general is. Then she went back to her own quarters, and now she seems to be headed in our direction. Is there anything wrong, Mrs. Morris? It's Maitland. What's wrong with the madam? He's disappeared. Disappeared? What's happened? We were in the tent together, making up for our performance, when an orderly came in with a message. Maitland said it was from his brother. Slipped on a raincoat and went out, saying he'd be back in a few moments. I waited and waited, and after a while I got worried, and I went over to see the general myself. He said that he'd sent no message. And that he hadn't seen any sign of Maitland. Good Lord, what can have happened to him? I don't know, Doctor, but I'm frightened. What shall I do, Mr. Holmes? You're a brave woman, Mrs. Morris. Brave? I don't know, Mr. Holmes. Why? Because the show must go on. I shall take your husband's place. But Holmes, something's happened to Maitland Morris. He's in danger. He might no, true, be... Watson, true. Huh? But a thousand men inside that tent are in mortal danger, too. Tomorrow morning, many of them may be corpses on the fields of Flanders. But tonight... They've been promised to show. Do you think that you can do it, Holmes? Oh, I think I can, with the help of Mrs. Morris. I can't do it, Mr. Holmes. You can, Mrs. Morris, and you will. If only to uphold that great tradition of the theatre that the show must go on. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Tom, I'd like to take to tell you that if you've got a butcher who has meat and you've got the points to get that meat, don't forget to bring home a bottle of Petri California Burgundy. Tell you why. That Petri Burgundy is a rich red mealtime wine that's wonderful with any meat or meat dish. That's a fact. Petri Burgundy can make a banquet out of a hamburger. And boy, Petri Burgundy and old-fashioned Irish stew are bosom companions. Just get yourself some Petri Burgundy and share it with your family. Petri Burgundy is the best friend a good meal ever had. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is just before the Battle of the Marne in the First World War, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are at headquarters a few miles behind the front-line trenches. A famous Shakespearean actor who was to give a performance for the troops has mysteriously disappeared, and the great detective has taken his place at the last minute. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes, alone on the improvised stage, is delivering a Shakespearean speech before a spellbound audience. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in a silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England... Holmes, that shot, are you all right? Yes, old chap. Fortunately, I started to leave the stage as the shot was fired. The bullet just missed me. And I heard it splinter some wood nearby. But who on earth would want to shoot you? That's what we've got to find out, though I think it more likely that the shot was intended for me. It was not intended for me, but for Maitland Morris, the man for whom I'm substituting. Well, even so, who'd want to shoot him? Oh, don't ask me so many questions, old fellow. Let's see what clues we can find. Now, the shot was fired from outside the tent from behind me. Yes, look there. See the hole in the tent there? By Jove, yes. The footlights would outline your shadow on the back of the tent. Whoever it must have, must have, must have fired at your silhouette. The question is, where did the bullet embed itself? Aha. Uh -huh. Look here, Watson. Have you got a pen knife? Yeah, wait a minute. Here I am. This shouldn't be hard to extract. Look at this splintered tent pole. Wait a minute. Yeah. There we are. Excellent. Very interesting. Well, what's so interesting about it? Just a revolver bullet, isn't it? Oh, no, it, it isn't, Watson. What? It's far, it's far from just a revolver bullet. This bullet was fired from a German Luger pistol. A German pistol? There must have been a spy here behind our lines. That's a reasonable enough assumption. Yes, we may be sure that 
No English soldier would carry such a weapon and face inspection. Come on, I want to talk to Mrs. Morris. Mrs. Morris, I want you to be very frank with me. But of course, Mr. Holmes. You know why your husband's missing, don't you? No, no, I don't. Have you found out anything? Come, come, madam. Why keep up this pretense any longer? I know that your husband is a spy, or at least a, a great sympathizer with the German cause. The general's brother a spy? Good Lord. How dare you say that? Because it's true. Foreign office have been suspicious of his sympathies for some time. His own brother knew it. That's why he asked to have me sent up here to keep an eye on him during his visit. It is true. Why should I keep up the pretense any longer? You see, Maitland was a disciple of Stuart Houston Chamberlain. Oh, who was this Stuart Houston Chamberlain? An Englishman who married one of Richard Wagner's daughters and became a German citizen and an arch enemy of England. I tried to dissuade Maitland. I implored him to consider his British heritage, his brother's name and mine. But Maitland was a strange man. His life was one of frustration and envy. Envy of his brother, I suppose. Yes. When Stanley was knighted, it, it hurt Maitland terribly. He said it was typical if the English would knight a soldier and yet leave a great artist like himself unrecognized. That in Berlin, they really understood and rewarded the artist. Well, if the authorities knew that, it's amazing they allowed him to come so close to the front lines at a time like this. Oh, it was at the general's request. He wanted to plead with my husband to warn him that his secret was known. And now Maitland's gone over to the German lines. Oh, it's terrible. It's worse than that. It's, it's disastrous. He can give them information as to the strength of our, our troops here. He knows the password. He might even know the hour of the attack is time to start. How did your husband expect to enter the German lines in safety, Mrs. Morris? He speaks fluent German, Mr. Holmes. I fancy the autograph book he was carrying containing the signature of Field Marshal von Tocknitz was in reality his pass through the German lines. You told the general that his brother was gone, of course. I haven't been able to. He moved up to the front line position immediately after the first performance. Though I had warned him what I thought Maitland was planning to do. I think he intended to give his performance first, then cross the lines immediately afterwards. But something must have made him change his mind. Perhaps he suspected I'd warned the general. Anyhow, as you know, when I got back to our quarters, he'd gone. Uh, did he leave any note, madam? Yes, he did. Here it is. Thank you. I have gone, my dear. Try and understand and forgive if you can. You wouldn't come with me, and so I'm taking what is left of my heart and my hopes where they belong, among the friends that understand and appreciate me. It is something stronger than love and blood and country that makes me do this. It is something dearer to me than life itself. Huh. Dearer to me than life itself. Oh, how could he? How could he? The shame of this will kill poor Stanley. Mr. Holmes, will you break the news to him? I know it's cowardly of me, but I just can't tell him myself. Don't worry, Mrs. Morris. I'll tell him. Dr. Watson and I will ask Cap Captain Maxwell to escort us to the General's frontline headquarters. In the meantime, try and keep calm. We'll tell him. If you will wait in the dugout, Mr. Holmes, I'll tell the general that you're here. Thank you, and be sure to let him know the urgency of the matter. Yes, sir. Holmes, this is a dreadful business. Yes, it is, Watson. Though if my plans work out correctly, I think the success of tomorrow's battle may not be imperiled. What plan? Shh. Listen. You know, Holmes, a strange silence from the German lines since we came here might be accounted for by the fact that they knew Maitland was making his getaway. They wouldn't want to risk wounding such a valuable spy. Quite possibly. What I still don't understand is who shot at you with a German pistol and why. You're being very dense, old fellow. Surely it's obvious that... Here comes General Morris now. Poor devil. This is going to be a dreadful shock to him. Hello, Holmes. Uh, Dr. Watson. General Morris, I'm afraid that I've bad news for you. Your brother has gone over to the German lines. Maitland did go there. I should have put him under an armed guard as soon as he came here, but, but I thought I could reason with him, appeal to his sense of honor. Instead of which, you tried to shoot him, sir, but uh, fortunately for me, you missed. You see, I took his place at the first performance. But that shot was fired from a German pistol. True. That was when I first knew the general had fired the shot. But I still don't see how you could now. Only a high-ranking officer, not subject to inspection, could carry a non-regulation firearm. 
You're an old army man. You should know that. In any case, you'll observe that the general carries a luger at his waist. Great heavens, Holmes. Uh, I thought I was firing at Maitland. Uh, I had no idea that, that it was you. You intended to kill your own brother, sir? Yes. And I'm sorry I failed. Uh, I'd rather see my brother dead than alive and a traitor to mm. his country. But now he, he's safely in the German lines. Heaven knows what secrets he may be imparting. Uh, one thing we can be certain of. Uh, our chance of a surprise attack in the morning is gone. Possibly not, sir. Oh, what do you mean, Holmes? Does he, I took the liberty of altering your brother's credentials quite extensively. How, Holmes? I knew of his German sympathies. Mycroft had given me a great deal of information about him, and so I took it on myself to decide that it was unsafe to allow him so near the enemy lines with his own identification on him. Well, what did you do, Holmes? I took the liberty, sir, of stealing his autograph book, the one containing the magical signature of Field Marshal von Tocknitz. I have it in my pocket now. I think we shall find within its pages a code concealed in the various autographs, giving valuable information to the enemy. Good Lord. I also switched uh, military permits on him. I felt that in the event that he did go over to the German lines, his welcome might be less cordial if they were under the impression that they'd uh, captured Sherlock Holmes. To make that identification doubly sure, I also slipped in his pocket a slight souvenir of my own. Why, right, Joe Holmes, you mean that medal was presented to you by the University of Leipzig? Exactly, old fellow. I no longer wish to uh, own a decoration given me by a country of barbarians, and it seemed a rather neat and effective way of returning it to them. So the Germans will think they've captured Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir, and unless I'm much mistaken, he'll receive very short shrift of their hands. Yes, they hate you. There's your answer, sir. I'm sorry. Well, don't be sorry, Holmes. It's better that way. Now his secret can die with him. Excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, yes, Maxwell, what is it? Would it be in order for me to return to headquarters now, sir? It's very nearly time for the second performance, and I've still been unable to trace the whereabouts of your brother. Well, my brother will not be acting tonight, I'm afraid. Holmes, I wonder if I might ask you to take his place once again. If you want me to, General. I do. Maitland had planned to do the St. Crispin speech from Henry V. Uh, he knew how much I loved him. I realize that, sir. Well, I was told the password up here. Well, can you remember the speech, Holmes? Oh, I think so. At any rate, I can try. Then do it for me, my dear fellow, will you? For me. I'll be very proud to do it, General. Goodbye and good luck. Thank you, Holmes. Captain Maxwell, uh, take them back to headquarters, will you? Uh, the men will be waiting for the performance. <laughs> Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. And all their manhoods cheap, while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispian's Day. <laughs> Well, Doctor, that was a bit of an exciting adventure. You <laughs> know, I, I can still remember that awful feeling I had when I heard the shot in the tent and realized someone had tried to kill Holmes. He did have a narrow escape, didn't <laughs> he? Well, Holmes always said there was no such thing as a narrow escape. He said you either escaped or you didn't. If you did, well, why worry? And if you didn't, uh, you couldn't worry. So what? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a philosophy. I'd uh, like to discuss it with you further. Uh, over uh, a, a bottle of wine? Uh, how else? Uh, what kind of wine? Uh, naturally. Uh, uh naturally. Uh, you couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri. That's because the Petri family knows how to make good wine. They ought to. They've been making fine wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And because the business has always been family-owned and operated, well, they've been able to hand on from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the art of turning luscious grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's why no matter what type Petri wine you buy for any occasion, you can be sure it's good wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, how's about giving us a clue to next week's Sherlock Holmes well, adventure? Well, next week, Mr. Clatter, I'm going to tell you in a most unusual adventure in which Holmes and I are trapped in an airtight metal chamber, our only companion being a murdered scientist. Well, sounds like a story we don't want to miss, Doctor. See you next week. Yes. Oh, just a second, Miss Slattery. Before we go, I, I just want to tell our listeners that tonight we're broadcasting from the stage of the Paramount Theatre here in Hollywood on behalf of the 7th Wall Owned Drive. The ticket of admission to the theatre was a war bond. I'm mentioning this to remind you, our friends, 
that you have an important part to play in making the seventh war loan a success. Buy more and buy bigger bonds than ever before. They're needed to pay for new super forts, new jet-propelled fighters, newer and bigger weapons to lick Japan. Remember, in spite of the magnificent achievements of our forces in the Pacific, the Japanese war has just begun. So let's go all out for the mighty seventh war loan. <laughs> Tonight, Sherlock Holmes' adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventures of the Blanched Soldier. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri. This is Jack Slattery saying good night for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. It was only a short time later that calls for the sale of war bonds would come to a complete halt. The reason? The dropping of the A-bomb on Japan. Not only did this bring the Second World War to an abrupt end, but it changed the entire life and rhythm of the world. I often feel that life might be richer if we could have grown into this atomic age at a slower pace. Still, we can go back in our imagination to an easier, slower time, a less, less violent time, a time of Sherlock Holmes and the good doctor. This is Ben Wright, and I'll join you again shortly with another new adventure of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs>